Good evening and welcome to the American Cetacean Society San Francisco Bay monthly speaker event, the second uh, of 2021, since it is the second month. I'm Susan Hopp, uh, a board member, and I'm here with fellow board member Gail Koza. Uh, and for anyone new to the American Cetacean Society, just a little background. We are the oldest nonprofit dedicated to the protection of whales, dolphins, porpoises, and their habitat. And we do this through education, community engagement, and grants toward marine research. Uh, we hope you will donate in support of our mission uh, by going to our website, which is in the chat. And I wanna say that no donation is too small and it will not only support our mission, as I said, but it will help us cover uh, the costs of, uh, of Zoom to do these webinars now that we've been on, online for the last um, many months. So we're in for a great talk tonight, uh, which actually continues our, one of our 2021 themes, which is human-induced impact on ocean wildlife. We are recording this session and we encourage you to put questions in the Q&A and we'll do our best to get to them uh, at the end of our, our speaker's talk. So our talk tonight is Vanishing Vaquitas, Lessons from a Humble Porpoise. And we're actually very thrilled to have Dr. Barbara Taylor with us who as much or maybe more than anyone is on the front lines of the plight of the vaquita. So let me start by telling you a little bit about Dr. Taylor as an introduction. She's been researching marine mammals for over 30 years. She led the Marine Mammal Genetics Group at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center in La Jolla, California for 50, 15 years and is now a senior scientist there. The group uses genetic data toward conservation and promotes guidelines and standards to facilitate naming new taxa of cetaceans based primarily on genetic data. She specializes in estimating risk of extinction and has worked with some of the most endangered species. Uh, Dr. Taylor chairs the Conservation Committee of the Society for Marine Mammalogy and serves as the listing authority for the Cetacean Specialist Group of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. In 2016, she was awarded the Society for Conservation Biology's LaRoe Award for her outstanding career achievements in translating conservation science into real world conservation efforts. She has been co-chief scientist on all Vaquita surveys. She is a member of the Vaquita recovery team, the steering committee for the acoustic monitoring project and led the search effort for the attempt to take Vaquitas into captivity. She co-chaired a workshop on options for cetacean conservation in 2018 and chaired a 2019 workshop to develop a one plan approach for Yangtze, Yangtze finless porpoise. And I gather that's in China, but anyway, thank you so much, Dr. Taylor for being here with us and uh, we'll turn it over to you now. Great. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm very impressed that people are still willing to come out and learn new things in their evenings. Um, and I hope that we uh, engender a very lively discussion. I, I, I wrote the talk, um, I hope to, to get the juices flowing. So I'm going to talk about the Kita, of course. Oh, maybe I'm not going to. Huh, there we go. Um, but I'm going to take you on quite a tour this evening. I'm going to uh, begin by talking about uh, marine mammal conservation history and, and how in the last century, uh, we developed recipes for conservation successes. And then I'm going to talk about vaquitas and what they teach us about changing that recipe. 
and bring in some lessons from terrestrial species and then end with talking about opportunities we have now to change that recipe. So let me begin with uh, sort of my own beginning. In, in 1972 and 1973, two of the strongest pieces of legislation for the environment were passed, the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. And that was right when I graduated from high school. And it had a, a huge impact on uh, my feeling that anything was possible um, if people put their minds to it. And, and what you see in the top graph is the depressing sequential depletion of all of the great whales of the world. There were over 2 million that were killed in the Antarctic and in the North Pacific, there were over 200,000 killed. And it was these really egregious acts against nature uh, that promulgated and gave people the will uh, to pass this really important uh, legislation that we uh, still depend on today. But one of the things that pushed the Marine Mammal Protection Act, a lot of people have uh, sort of forgotten about or maybe they never even knew this history. Um, in the year that the Marine Mammal Protection Act was passed in 1972, 368, 600,000 dolphins were killed by US vessels in the tuna fleet in a single year. I mean, this is just a stunning number. And I think people have forgotten about what an environmental crisis this was. And so Congress passed this law and expected that it would solve this problem in two years. Um, and Part of the law actually required the agency that I work for, NOAA, to uh, give the tuna industry a quota that they were not to exceed. And they set this quota at 50 to 110,000, despite not knowing how many dolphins there were. Um, and it was immediately challenged in court. And the courts responded very quickly. Um, and Judge Ritchie ruled before issuing any permit for the taking of a marine mammal, the secretary must first have it proven to his satisfaction that any taking is consistent with the purposes and policies of the act. That is to say that taking will not be to the disadvantage of the animals concerned. If he cannot make that finding, he cannot issue a permit. It is that simple. And so by this uh, ruling, Basically, that judge changed the, the burden of proof. You had to show no harm before it was permitted. And you can see the result in the decline of the number of deaths of dolphins. And it was driven both by research, um, telling how many dolphins there were and, and how much killing they could sustain, but also by research into changing the gear. <clears throat> but that wasn't the end of the story. Um, even though the, the change in the fishing gear that allowed them to surround the dolphins and the tunas and let the dolphins escape was uh, an amazing uh, invention, it cost time and time is money. And so the tuna fleet switched its flag from being a US tuna fleet to flagging with other countries. And you can see the number of dolphin deaths started to go up. So in comes this fellow, Sam Labuddy, who went undercover uh, onto a tuna vessel and filmed dolphins being caught live in nets and pulled up and smashed in the blocks on the, on the tuna vessel. And that was showed to millions of Americans on the evening news. And it had an um, enormous uh, effect. There was a huge uh, consumer boycott of tuna um, and the uh, Starkist company sat down with the NGOs and agreed to have a dolphin safe label that you can still see on your tuna cans today. Um, and the other tuna canneries followed suit. And so this was really something that was consumer driven, you know, picked up by the, the, the industry and it was only later that that was uh, added on to the Marine Mammal Protection Act um, as part of the law. And I think that's a really important lesson um, that 
that consumers can have a really important effect um, that uh, drives some very important conservation actions. But nevertheless, um, from the time the Marine Mammal Protection Act was passed until that was finally more or less resolved, over 2 million dolphins died. Um, and it took many, many years. And it's just evidence that these things take a long time. And if they, if they hadn't enacted the law, certainly millions of more dolphins would have died. But still, these things take time and we don't always have that time. The other influential thing early in my career um, was I worked out on the ice um, with the Eskimo whalers um, to try to determine how many bowhead whales there were. The whalers um, were accused um, of taking too many whales um, in the early 1980s. Um, and the International Whaling Commission and the US government uh, put pressure on the whalers to uh, show that this endangered species was not being further endangered by whaling. And so the communities totally took it on. They formed the uh, Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission. Um, they came up with the abundance estimates uh, working together with the scientists um, and came up with their own quota system. And today, um, most of the bowheads that are swimming around out there were born since I was a 20 something year old out on the ice. So a really important uh, success story that was driven by community conservation. So what made these laws and rules effective? Well, governmental will that was fueled by public support, empowered implementers, enforcement, or at least fear of enforcement, users that were motivated to sustainable use, data to drive the management, NGOs and courts to check the implementation, well-educated and concerned public, and conservation issues that could be solved through regulatory mechanisms. So it takes quite a, an elaborate recipe to have a conservation success. And unless you have all of those things, um, you don't have a success. And, and so in, in the last century, um, these ingredients, um, if you put them all together, um, really could turn things around. Now I'm gonna talk about some failures um, and how we have to change that recipe. So this is a, a, a Yangtze river dolphin or a Baiji. And uh, it was the most critically endangered marine mammal throughout the late uh, 1990s and into the early 2000s. Um, and the uh, issues that were facing it in the Yangtze river were not being resolved. <clears throat> so in 2006, I was part of a, the group that you see here that went out to try to find the last of the Baiji to take them into Oxbow Lake Reserves where they could be protected from the many hazards they were facing in the Yangtze River. We covered their entire habitat four different times, both visually and acoustically, and we saw or heard not a single Baiji. And we had to conclude that the species that had been on the earth for 35 million years had gone extinct while no one was looking. This was a, a tragic outcome and it certainly stiffened our resolve to not let that happen with Vaquita. So Vaquita are a small porpoise uh, that lives in that tiny uh, area up in the northern gulf with a little yellow oval. Um, it's uh, called Ficina sinus because it lives way up in the top of that sinus. Um, its nearest relative is all the way down in Peru, so it's very isolated. It's basically like an island species, and it's got a tiny distribution, um, and it's naturally rare. So it's, it's very vulnerable uh, to uh, human impacts, and of course, it's there because it's very productive um, fishery, fishery. And uh, so there are two uh, fishing villages that are right next to its, uh, the only place that vaquitas live. So because they were uh, seen dead in fishing nets, 
Lorenzo Rojas Bracho, who has led uh, Vaquita Science uh, right from the beginning, and I wrote a paper way back in the 1990s um, looking at the important threats to Vaquita. And we found that there really were no threats from pollutants, inbreeding depression, or the lack of the Colorado River flow. Um, but we were still seeing lots of, of dead animals in fishing nets. And at the time, there were about a thousand of these uh, small type fishing boats that are called pongas. And each one of those are setting uh, thousands of meters of gill nets. <clears throat> and and uh, certainly that was uh, something that was known to be a threat to marine mammals. So Caterina da Grossa did a study uh, in 1993 to 1995, and she found that about 78 vaquitas were being killed annually, and they were killed in every single type of gill net. Oh, that's sort of loud. <laughs> So I'm going to show you uh, the, the difficulty we had in actually figuring out whether 78 was too many, because we didn't know how many vaquitas there were. And there you see a vaquita. Um, they're a really tiny animal. They're about five feet long. They're about 120 pounds. And usually they're just in singles and pairs like this. So they don't jump up and splash around so you can see them like big schools of dolphins. <clears throat> and uh, they, as I mentioned, live in this area that is relatively remote um, and often pretty darn windy. And so you can only see them when it's absolutely glassy calm like this. When it's Beaufort zero, you have a chance. But even then it's difficult because these animals are very shy and they avoid motor noise. So in Mexico, the fisherman's name for them is fantasma, which means ghost. And many, many fishermen have never seen this animal alive. They may have seen them dead in their fishing net, but they've never seen them alive. And so we had to go out and try to uh, figure out how many of these there were in the Northern Gulf. So we went out and used uh, the methods actually that were developed in the tuna dolphin uh, era, uh, putting these big binoculars, uh, 25 power binoculars that we call big eyes, uh, because uh, we had to see these animals before they snuck away from our vessel. Basically using binoculars, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible to, to see them. You just can't see far enough with regular binoculars. So we used these big eyes and you can see at the very top, a whole range of them um, with our very top uh, observers. And in 1997, we estimated there were around 600 vaquitas. And what that meant was given the life history of this species, which is very slow growing, um, that 78 vaquitas was unsustainable for a population of 600. After the tragedy of the Baiji, um, we came back and resolved that we were not going to let Vaquita slip away uh, unnoticed. So we went out and did another big survey in 2008, both to estimate abundance and also to develop a way to monitor their status every single year. So the abundance estimate showed that there were only about 250 vaquitas left. Um, so 600 down to 250 in about 10 years. And that was driven in large part um, by uh, gill netting for shrimp, which was exported to the United States. So we, we have a great deal of blame to go um, in the problem of, of uh, vaquitas being killed accidentally. We found that because vaquitas are compulsive echolocators, that's how they find their food in this murky water, they echolocate about 10 times higher than bats. And this passive acoustic recorder that you see on the right, it's about uh, three feet tall there. And you can anchor it at the bottom and it records uh, the event of a vaquita click every time a vaquita click happens. Um, and so it's called a passive acoustic uh, monitoring device. And uh, we found that we could uh, monitor the 
status of Akita and how it changed every year using a grid of these uh, C pods. And we typically would put them out all summer. And so we would gather over 3000 days of data per year. And that allowed us a pretty precise ability to monitor the trends uh, in abundance. Here's the, the actual grid. Let me orient you a bit. Um, this little point, San Felipe, the village of San Felipe is right here. The Colorado River is up at the top. This uh, faint red outline is a vaquita refuge that was set aside by the government of Mexico where no gill netting was uh, allowed. And so we set our detectors in a grid. Um, the C pod was in at every one of those circles um, and I used that to uh, gather data to tell us uh, how the vaquitas were faring. And what we expected and what the government of Mexico expected was that because that area represents about 50% of the full distribution of vaquitas, that that decline that we saw uh, in the previous decade would either stop or the animals might even increase a bit. But unfortunately, uh, that is not what we observed. We expected a leveling or an increase and instead we uh, observed a drastic decline um, that was uh, the result of the resumption of an illegal fishery for the large fish that you see there. Actually, that's a fairly small totuaba. Totuabas are uh, the same size of, as vaquitas, but they're quite a bit chunkier. They're sort of like a linebacker. Um, <clears throat> and they're valued in China for their swim bladder, which is used for medicinal purposes. And in fact, the reason that El Golfo de Santa Clara and San Felipe, the two fishing villages are there is because of trading Totuaba swim bladder to China. But the fish was almost completely wiped out in the 1960s and 70s. And the Totuaba and the Vaquita were put on the endangered species list together in the mid 1980s in Mexico. Uh, because that fishery was uh, driving both of these species towards extinction. In about 2011, um, the Totuabas uh, were actually recovering and the illegal trade to China resumed, but this time China had a lot more money. And so the value of a buche, the swim bladder, could bring up to $50,000. And the fishermen were getting eight to $10,000 for a single fish. Um, it's more valuable per pound than cocaine. So it is now called the cocaine of the sea. And this is sort of an, an irresistible uh, poaching activity um, for the local fishermen. When we demonstrated the decline, um, the government of Mexico took it very seriously. And the president of Mexico came to San Felipe in 2015 and announced a program with four parts, increase in for enforcement, ban gill nets within the range of Akita, accelerate development of alternative fishing methods and compensate fishermen not to fish. So on the right, you can see the area uh, the historic area of vaquitas is hatched in with the yellow. Um, the little dots are uh, actual confirmed vaquita detections. You can see the vaquita refuge again. Um, but the uh, gillnet band was that large area that is inside that red line. Um, so they, they took this very seriously. And we were very hopeful that this would uh, turn the tide for Vaquita. They also commissioned us to go out and do another uh, abundance estimate. So we did a, a full visual and acoustic estimate and found that only uh, 60 Vaquitas remained in uh, 2015. And they were declining at 34% per year. But there was seemingly good news. So this is a, a photograph of the uh, radar screen on the ship. 
um, in 2008. And the little dots that you see are, uh, each one of those is a ponga with a couple thousand meters of net out. Um, and the bright yellow line is the boundary of the Vaquita refuge. And you can see that uh, it's basically like a web of death around the Vaquita refuge, but that 50% that's inside the Vaquita refuge um, was actually uh, being effectively enforced. This is that same scene in 2015. We saw no pongas and no gill nets. And you can see the, the radar screen on the right, those bright spots are actually shrimp trawlers. Um, and we just saw no evidence of fishing. Um, and we were all you know, very excited by this. But our surveys are typically done in September and October, and the Totaba don't show up to spawn until December. So in December, uh, the poaching resumed, and uh, fortunately, there are two groups that uh, are, deserve many kudos, the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society and Museo de Baena, which is a local NGO. Um, that uh, work with the Mexican Navy to remove these illegal nets. And, and you see uh, an illegal net being held up there. Those are actually held down to the bottom by that giant anchor. And there's no marking on the surface at all. And the fishermen find uh, where the net is using GPS, pull it up, take the totoaba out, and then just drop the net back down to the bottom. Uh, so, you know, for months on end, you have this lethal net uh, down there uh, catching totoas and sadly vaquitas. So despite all their heroic efforts, um, our acoustic monitoring showed that they dropped uh, another 50%. Um, in 2016, there were only 30 remaining. So the recovery team decided that our best conservation op option at this point was to try to remove as many vaquitas as possible into human care until this uh, totoaba poaching could be resolved. So vaquita CPR, Conservation Protection and Recovery was formed um, with the intent of uh, capturing vaquitas. In 2017, we had 90 participants from nine different countries, um, and we had to find, catch, house, and care for vaquitas, something no one had done before. We modified the methods, the acoustic methods, so that um, the Mexican team would go put the sea uh, uh, pods out um, every day, um, leave them out most of the night, then go out and pick them up in the middle of the night. Then they would analyze all the data and call me at three in the morning and tell me where the vaquitas were, had been detected. And we would he head out in the dark uh, so that we could be in position when there were light winds in the morning to uh, be able to see vaquitas um, and then direct in the catcher boats. And the, the team that was working uh, to catch the vaquitas were uh, Danes. Um, they had uh, very successfully been able to tag, uh, catch and tag harbor porpoise um, in Iceland and, and the North Atlantic and the Baltic. Um, and so they came over with their methods uh, to help us try to catch vaquitas. <clears throat> we also had to be ready to take care of any vaquitas that we caught. Uh, so we had a specialist team that constructed uh, a land facility with uh, interior pools. And we had a sea facility um, that actually had a floating uh, veterinary care uh, unit built right into the, into the sea pen. And then we basically had every porpoise uh, veterinarian and biologist we could find um, that was out there to, to help us in this operation and to be able to uh, do the uh, veterinary assessment when the animals uh, were caught. So on October 18th, we caught the very first vaquita. She was a six month old calf um, and uh, you can see a very lovely little animal. 
Um, they took her to both the sea pen and the land facility, but she didn't settle down. And so they took her right back out uh, where we were uh, keeping track of uh, where the mom was and released her. And then we caught an adult female. She seemed like an ideal candidate. She was uh, not lactating, no, no calf in evidence. Um, and the <clears throat> initial assessment was very good. She was uh, breathing well, her lungs were clear, her heart rate was fine. They took her into the uh, sea pen um, and she swam around. People were getting ready to stay overnight and uh, then she just sank to the bottom. Um, and they tried an emergency release, uh, but unfortunately she died from capture myopathy. Um, and veterinarians determined that uh, capturing vaquitas, which is also called ex situ conservation, um, was not an option for vaquitas because there's no opportunity to learn when you have fewer than 30 individuals remaining. You need to do this when there are hundreds of thousands, uh, not tens of animals. Since then, um, the acoustic monitoring showed another 50% decline uh, from 2017 to 2018. Uh, and the animals have fallen back to a very small area, which the recovery team has named the zero tolerance area, um, where uh, we pleaded with the government to just guard that area with everything you can, keep the nets out of where these vaquitas are are basically making their last stand. So we were able to uh, photograph some of the animals and found uh, this mother that you see here that had calves in two uh, sequential years, um, which was really exciting because before that we thought they could only calf every two years. So this uh, could potentially double their rate of recovery. Our last big field effort was in 2019. Um, and in that small area, we es estimated that we saw about 10 animals, including three calves. And then last year, um, there was very limited uh, opportunity to get out there, but there were um, some sea uh, pods put out and a small visual effort, and they both saw and heard vaquitas. But there's some really bad news as well. Um, in 2018, uh, the current new government in Mexico uh, cut off all compensation to fishermen. And of course, the financial times are very hard down there right now. And so the fishermen just went out and set nets everywhere. Um, and so when we were out there trying to get photographs, you can see um, they're setting uh, gill nets right around the vaquitas. And we were having a hard time even maneuvering to get photographs. The Sea Shepherd um, continues to do, or was continuing to do work. Um, and what you see here again is here's the point where San Felipe, the town of San Felipe is right here. This is uh, the edge of the Vaquita Refuge. The red zone is the zero tolerance area. And each one of these dots is a ponga with a net or several pongas with nets. This is from this last December. Um, it looked like they're concentrated in the zero tolerance area, but actually that's where Sea Shepherd was concentrating their activities. Um, there actually were plenty of gillnets outside of that area uh, as well. Unfortunately, on December 31st, um, the Sea Shepherd vessels were under attack um, by uh, some violent uh, fishermen who were throwing Molotov cocktails at them. And uh, they were uh, leaving the area and a ponga swerved in front of one of the vessels. Um, and unfortunately, um, one of the fishermen was killed. So the Sea Shepherd has now left the area. Um, there's no uh, net removal going on. There is a vessel that belongs to Museo de Ballena that's in San Felipe, uh, but the owner who truly is a saint and has funded most of this uh, research uh, from the proceedings from his restaurants um, has been hit very hard by COVID um, 
because all the restaurants are closed. And so there's no operational funds uh, to continue the net removal. So it's a pretty desperate situation. We put updates um, on the Vaquita situation every month on the IUCN CSG, which stands for Cetacean Specialist Group uh, website, um, if you want to keep up with uh, what is going on there. So the lessons from our humble forefest. Uh, the greatest threat to marine mammals is accidental death in gill nets. It's a global problem. At a minimum, hundreds of thousands of animals are killed each and every year. Changing human behavior um, takes longer than most of these coastal and river marine mammals have before they face extinction. And we learned from the vaquita that if we are going to be able to use these ex situ options, um, we must start sooner when there's hundreds rather than tens of animals. So we know that we've had some pretty shocking failures um, and that the recipe for conservation success in this cent cent century has to change, but how? First, let me talk a little bit about what is ex situ conservation. Um, the IUCN uh, has put out some very useful guidebooks and they um, define uh, ex situ conservation as maintaining animals under artificial conditions that have different selection pressures than uh, natural conditions and natural habitats. And there are a number of potential roles, including insurance populations, temporary rescue, long-term maintenance, and as a source for population restoration. And as you'll see, um, for cetaceans, this does not mean uh, putting animals in aquariums. I think um, it would be probably not successful um, to do that. And it's much better to maintain the animals where they can uh, behave naturally and uh, be readily reintroduced back into their habitat successfully. So let me give you um, some examples of ex situ conservation from terrestrial mammals, which I, I think are uh, really heartwarming. There's an excellent book written by Jane Goodall called Hope for the Animals, uh, where she summarizes uh, what has happened with ex situ conservation and, and terrestrial animals. Um, and here I've summarized from that book um, the species that went completely extinct in the wild. And on the right, you can see the number of animals at the lowest point. And all of those cases have now been reintroduced back into their natural habitat and would be extinct were it not um, for some very hands-on conservation. And I wanna highlight the Pierre David's deer, uh, which had at its lowest point 10, because I'll talk about them a little bit more in a bit. There's only one single example of ex situ uh, conservation for a cetacean, and that is with the Yangtze finless porpoise, um, which uh, we did observe um, when we didn't find Baiji. We did see those little round backs that you see up at the top there um, and got uh, uh, a new abundance estimate, um, which unfortunately uh, moved them from being an endangered species to being a critically endangered species. Uh, but the Chinese uh, were uh, working away at having an insurance population. So we went to China in November, 2019. It turns out along with COVID-19, um, we were in Wuhan uh, meeting with our Chinese colleagues to learn about what they had done um, and uh, uh, talk about developing uh, integrated conservation management plans for uh, cetaceans. So we learned firsthand uh, what these uh, XC2 uh, reserves are. They call them semi-natural oxbow reserves. These are basically lakes that were part of the river um, in a not too distant past. And you can see there's several of boxes along the river um, that are uh, <clears throat> this, the reserves uh, that are in use. Uh, Dr. Wang Ding uh, started taking porpoises into uh, these uh, reserves in the 1990s. Um, 
in preparation for taking Baiji in so that they could learn how to care for these animals before they started taking the much more rare um, Baiji in, into the Oxbow Lakes. This is uh, Tiani Zhu. It is a, a, a very large lake um, and the pen that you see there um, is only if, if animals need um, veterinary care. But there's about 125 porpoises that uh, live and feed and breed and basically lead a natural life in a, a very large lake. Um, and <clears throat> it, they basically lead the same life that they would be living if they were in the river, um, but they're completely protected from um, all of their threats. And China is now uh, in a major effort to clean up the mother Yangtze. The fellow that you see with the big lens there is China's Minister of the Environment. He's actually taking pictures of Pierre David's deer that have been introduced um, in, onto the shores of the Yangtze Finless Porpoise uh, Oxbow Lake Reserve. Um, and you may recall that there were at one time only 10 individuals that were in a private reserve in Great Britain. Um, and these animals now uh, live by the hundreds on the shores of the Yangtze in their uh, former native habitat. So a real success story. This is the Yangtze River as I experienced it in 2006. And this is what I experienced in 2019. Those are actual swans uh, flying over the Oxbow Lake. And the boats that you see anchored there um, are fishing boats. Um, in 2020, uh, the government of China made all commercial fishing on the Yangtze River illegal. So the lessons from the Yangtze finless porpoise are that fisheries issues can be solved or reduced but with very strong governmental will and very strong governance. And for many of our small cetacean species and certainly including the kitas, um, that just wasn't there. And that semi-natural reserves can provide insurance populations, but even for these finless porpoise, real success took about 20 years. So you have to be thinking uh, far down the line. So what can we say about our, our recipe? Um, basically the main elements I think uh, are remain the same, but they need to be greatly augmented. Um, the users uh, need to include all of the stakeholders that will be affected by conservation actions. The implementers includes not only enforcement, but also parties that facilitate economic and social changes. The scientists includes not only animal specialists, but social scientists. And finally, and very importantly, the courts includes establishing a functional system of justice. And all of these take time. So we need more tools in our toolbox and we need tools that buy us the time that we need to save these species. So in 2018, um, a group of us that were involved in Vaquita CPR, plus a, a large group of biologists that worked with other small cetaceans that are also endangered or critically endangered, met in Nuremberg, Germany to discuss XC2 options for cetaceans. And we've just uh, published the publication that you see there on the left, it's available on the IUCN website. And through that process, I think we really came to appreciate that it isn't so much talking about XC2 conservation as it is integrated conservation planning for cetaceans. That it takes so long to learn about how to, what the best options are for these animals that we need to start working to learn about how do we deal with capture myopathy uh, decades in advance. And, and a lot of what we learned can be learned in the process of learning about in situ conservation. You know, where are these animals spending their time? What kind of food are they eating? Why are they running into these nets? So integrating these two groups together, working together 
over the decades is going to give us the fill the information gaps that we need to be able to do emergency conservation should we need it. So what can be done for vaquitas? Well, I truly believe that vaquitas could recover if we just stop killing them. We just uh, published a paper um, of the full vaquita genome that uh, came from the living cells from the female that died, uh, but her cells live on in the San Diego frozen zoo and provided high quality uh, DNA that showed that vaquitas have been naturally rare for hundreds of thousands of years and that they don't show any signal of inbreeding, um, which is very important to know that they should be able to recover um, even from these very low numbers. And certainly we're seeing lots of fat, healthy calves. There are great examples of recovery. Um, Harbor Porvis in San Francisco Bay um, and Monterey Bay. You know, Once you stopped the, uh, the gill netting, um, the animals came back. It might take a while, um, but, but they did come back. Northern elephant seals um, were completely extirpated from California, and there were only roughly 30-ish of them, no one really knows, on the island of Guadalupe off of Mexico. And now, as everyone knows, we have hundreds of thousands of them fully occupying their historic range. So I think the animals can recover if you give, a, give them a break, um, but unfortunately, they're not getting that break. Um, we need to support the net removal and guarding the zero tolerance area. And funding is really desperately needed at this point. And there still needs to be pressure brought to bear on Mexico to actually take actions uh, to guard the ZTA and to support alternative gear training and use. So I'll conclude with uh, some broader questions. How, how can Americans stop extinctions of small cetaceans? Um, and, and I think a lot of that has to do with being a, a good consumer. Americans are some of the largest consumers of global seafood. And we need to ask questions about whether our seafood has been caught with gill nets and we need to support sustainable fishing. It's all about sustainability. And I think, you know, clearly we're in a crisis. We're in this sixth extinction. We're suffering uh, the uh, climate change crisis and the pandemic crisis. All of these are global things. And maybe it will inspire us uh, to see that like, the, it's a much bigger crisis than in the early 1970s when that strong legislation was passed. Um, and maybe now that we're seeing these crises and seeing the results of our actions, um, we can embrace that we need to live sustainably on this planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. Quite a... Um way to talk and thank you for sharing all of your experience and uh, and the, the 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 questions and the opportunity that we all have to uh, to make um, changes so I think we have some good questions and uh, but before we start the questions I also just want to acknowledge that some of the beautiful artwork that we saw in uh, in the slides is our also, um, Dr. Taylor is also an artist. So pretty wonderful. Good therapy. <laughs> Gail, do you okay. wanna jump in to yes. moderating the questions? Yes, yes. Um, okay, let's see, we have some great questions here. Um, and if you joined late, um, please feel free to put any questions that you may have into the Q&A section of Zoom. Um, all right, let's start with Sea Shepherd. You, you mentioned the, the great work that Sea Shepherd has been doing, important work, and their unfortunate um, departure. Um, we just had a couple questions about what you think about their gill net removal methods and have you worked with them directly? Um, 
And also, do you have any idea if they're planning to return to the area and continue their, um, their project there, their mission there? Um, yes, I have worked with them directly. Um, and I, I think the world of them. I mean, they, they've just been amazing, committed. I mean, if you want to see conservation in action, um, you know, seeing young people from all, out of, all over the world out there, you know, pulling up these stinky, horrible nets with all sorts of gross dead things in them. I mean, it's really, it is really hard work and it's heartbreaking work. I mean, they do get to release some animals alive, but man, it is a slog and they do it year after year. And they've had two dedicated vessels down there every year. Um, so I, I think they've been doing a tremendous job and really without them and Museo de Baena, I, I think we wouldn't have the Kitas today. So, <clears throat> you know, I think they're great. Um, it's been a really difficult situation, especially the last couple of years as the violence against them has increased. And, and in fact, last year um, they were gone even before COVID. Um, they were shut down uh, partway through the season because of uh, active violence against the ships. And you know, the ships are like you know, doing everything they can um, to, to be able to continue to operate um, in a situation like that, but it's difficult. And, and you should know that they actually have Mexican Navy guys on board with big guns. I mean, they're, they're, they're not out there entirely by themselves and they're escorted by Navy boats and in constant contact with the Navy. So it's, it really is a joint operation. Um, but whether they can continue um, right now, um, they are in negotiations with the government of Mexico to um, change their memorandum of understanding. And a lot of us are really worried about it. I mean, they're, they haven't given up, they're staying in the area. Both ships are in Mexico somewhere um, and hoping to go back. The Totuaba season is just starting to peak. So uh, hopefully they can come back and start doing net removal operations. But um, nobody's really seen what the government of Mexico is writing up in the change memor memorandum of understanding. Um, and uh, we're, all, we're all very worried about it. Um, but we hope that they can, that they can get back there. Wonderful. Thank you. We hope so too. <laughs> um, another question about surveys. Do you know, is, is there a plan for another uh, Vaquita survey this year um, to, you know, count the Vaquitas, monitor health? Um, are, and also related to that, are any boat surveys able to be done with a quieter vessel? Um, to reduce disruption to the vaquitas? So let me tackle the first one. Um, ho we hope we can get down. Um, the, the last, the 2019 uh, effort that we did, we actually used the Museo de Baena's boat, ironically called the Narval, <laughs> the only Narval in Mexico. Um, and the one of the Sea Shepherd vessels, and they now have purchased their own set of big eyes um, and are helping with the research. So um, I'm optimistic that we can get back out there again. Um, and our observers that we've had since 1997, hugely dedicated, um, I, I think they'll all come back. So hopefully we'll be able to get out there in the fall um, and uh, you know, check on the animals and see how they're doing. The acoustic team also has been um, working on coming up with ways that they can uh, still get some data and not have their equipment stolen. So that's one of the things I didn't talk about, but unfortunately um, it's been a full court press on science and conservation. And so we had a lot of our acoustic uh, detectors stolen and uh, so now they're, they've come up with some sneaky ways to do it, which I won't tell you about. <laughs> but they're hoping they can get out and get us some more acoustic data. And, and actually, I, I should say that, you know, humans are, you know, seeing is believing. 
but really the best data are the acoustic data because you can leave them out there. I mean, for this rare animal, you can leave the detectors out there for a lot longer period and get a much better idea of you know, where the animals are and where their habitat is, but you can't see whether there's calves. And that's just so important to provide people hope for the species to be able to get out there and actually see that they're still having fat healthy calves. Thank you. Um, let's hope there will be a survey. Um, okay, uh, a couple of questions related to the population and the genes, uh, gene pool. What's your estimate for the number of remaining um, breeding age females and males in the vaquita population? And do you think that population is so small that the gene pool is, is too far depleted? You did mention earlier that there was some really solid DNA evidence that um, the size has not been a problem. There hasn't been inbreeding. So I think your answer to that is no, but I'll let you elaborate about that. Sure. So um, when we go out and actually see vaquitas, um, we frequently don't get close enough to be able to get a really good photograph and identify animals. So we have to use a process called expert elicitation to use all the expertise out there to try to estimate the number of animals that we saw. And that was what I presented that we estimated there were around 10, but there could be up to 15. And that our best guess was that there were three calves, but there could be up to six calves. So, you know, it's, it's very difficult to come up with a very precise estimate. Um, but I, I personally was pretty encouraged that out of seven sightings that we had in a week, uh, six of them had a calf in it. I mean, which to me is like every adult female is having a calf. I mean, basically that's what that says. And, they're, and they were fat, you know, so I, they're certainly not food limited. Um, so, so that's all, um, very good news. And what was the second part? Oh, this about the genes. Mm -hmm. So when we looked at the, the vaquita genome, so the reason I started into vaquita work, the first time that I met Lorenzo Rojas Bracho, he walked into my office and said, I'm a Mexican student, I'm doing my uh, graduate work. And I looked at the mitochondria of vaquitas, and they basically all have the same mitochondria and I and I want to know you know what can we say about that that will advise the Mexican government on whether it's too late now remember this is when there were 600 right so so the Kitas had very very low genetic diversity even when we first started studying them and we have in our collection in La Jolla we actually have the samples from the vaquitas that Lorenzo did his PhD on in the 1990s. And we have some in the 2000s and we have some in the 2010s. So we've been able to look across the time to see whether the genetic variability has changed. And basically it hasn't changed. I mean, they, they didn't really have much to begin with. And when we looked at the full genome, it's basically low genetic diversity, but very even all the way throughout the genome. And when you use some fancy programs that basically look at, you know, what, what does that tell us about their demographic history, the numbers of vaquitas through time? It says that basically about 200,000 years ago, um, for whatever reason, it went down to about maybe 5,000 vaquitas and stayed that way for the last 200,000 years. So they don't have much genetic diversity, but on the other hand, um, they've had 200,000 years to purge any genetic load. And so, you know, that, that I think is not, a, it's not on my list of things to be worried about. Um, as with any island population though, um, you always worry about, you know, well, what if a disease gets in there? You know, I mean, it's, I mean, they're basically like an island population. And so you, you have to be concerned about that, but 
it's you know nowhere near the level of concern of totoaba poaching. Okay, thank you. Um, lots of great questions coming in here. Let's try to tackle some more. Um, so we, we did have a follow-up question about in situ conservation. Um, and essentially it was, you know, it, is, is it really not possible to try again? Uh, is, are the population numbers too low at this point? Um, is that the last hope for them? So we'll tie that to another question, which is, you know, essentially, do you still have hope for the vaquita? Do you think they can come back even despite all of these challenges that you've talked about tonight? So I think that X C2, taking them into captivity, um, basically that the veterinarians made the call when it came right down to it. They said, if we went out and we captured another vaquita, we would have no better chance of saving it than we did with the last vaquitas. And the only two vaquitas both showed signs of, of being stressed by human handling. And, and I should point out that capture myopathy is a really common reaction of animals to um, stress. And with all other animals, giraffes, antelopes, the veterinarians have had to learn sort of the hard way you know, often. I mean, it's different with every animal and they figure out how to control it behaviorally and they figure out how to control it with drugs. But, you know, sadly, you, you're probably gonna lose some animals as you are on that steep part of the learning curve. And with cetaceans, we're really on this steep part of the learning curve. So they just didn't feel that the prognosis for the next vaquita was good enough to, you know, take that animal's life into their hands. So I don't, I think that that is, is not being considered. Um, meanwhile, um, it's inspired the veterinarians to get together and have a workshop on capture myopathy and putting together all the knowledge about other animals. And um, there's a project with a, uh, a dolphin that lives off of South America called Franciscana that looks a lot like a river dolphin with a big long snout. Um, and they've been doing um, tagging, Randy Wells and a bunch of very competent South American biologists have been doing tagging. It's like, take veterinarians along and we can learn about stress by you know, taking rapid blood samples and seeing how much individual variability there are, whether there's difference by age and sex, you know, whether we can reduce, if we have a stressed animal, whether we can reduce it by giving them certain drugs. So, so it inspired a lot of other work so that we won't, won't you know, be in the same position of having to you know, pull out when they need us most, really. Um, I, I think that the really the only thing that can be done for vaquitas, I mean, vaquitas are doing an amazing job themselves. I mean, when I think about, you know, reporting, there was a 50% decline, a 50% decline. These animals that we are seeing out there, the last ones that are holding out in the zero tolerance area, the reason we can identify them is because they have nicks in their dorsal fins and they have nicks in their dorsal fins because they were entangled in nets and they survived. And so I think this isn't just a random collection of vaquitas out there. I think these are the survivors. These are the 1% that have been living in amongst all of these nets and managing to survive. And so they are you know, the hope of their species. If you can just keep that tiny area, it's 24 kilometers by 12 kilometers, you know, just keep the fishermen out of that area and let the animals do their thing. I think that's the biggest hope. And, and the problem is, is that, you know, it's so far the government of Mexico is lots of talk and no action. And, uh, and that's the last thing that vaquitas need right now. They, they really need, you know, some agreement with the fishermen to stay out of that area. And, uh, and, and Sea Shepherd was working really hard with fishermen and, and there are very many good fishermen out there. 
It's just that there's, you know, really bad fishermen as well. And they're the ones with the guns. That's a, that's a good lead in um, related to the very bad fishermen with the guns. Um, let's talk about a little bit about um, your experience with what some of the challenges have been related to enforcement. Um, so the questions that have come in are, um, <clears throat> you know, what are the issues with enforcement against the trade in Totuaba swim bladders? Um, you know, for example, I've, I've heard that there's cartel involvement in, uh, in this Totuaba business now. I don't know if you can speak to that at all and what some of the challenges have been. Um, uh, are, have there been further, you know, efforts at making regulatory changes or are there certain leaders um, to whom we should be vocalizing our concern and um, pushing for changes? Um, so maybe enforcement and regulatory government leadership will to, to do more, if you can tackle those topics. Well, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> So they put the Navy in charge of enforcement, um, but it's a very complicated situation where the fisheries department really has the power to arrest people. And then of course the courts have, has the power to convict and, and put people in jail or fine them. And the Navy doesn't have the power to do either of those. And it turns out the Navy cannot use force against the citizens of Mexico. And once that became apparent, um, I don't know if you saw the Sea of Shadows, but there was a, a movie that was put out called the Sea of Shadows. And in that movie, there's this, you know, basically they, the Navy arrests a fisherman and um, there's a riot that happens <clears throat> right at the Navy facility and they basically beat up the Navy guys and the Navy guys just stand there and take it. They just, they just get, you know, hospitalized. And it's because they can't use force against the citizens of Mexico. And so it's, it's still a, a real issue because uh, the current government of Mexico has now said, Conopesca, which is the fisheries department, is so corrupt that we're not going to we're, we're going to give their power of enforcement to the Navy. But the Navy is still constrained by not being able to use force, and the fishermen know it. And these are the bad fishermen, by the way. You know, I mean, the guys who are you know basically poachers. They're they're you know, and. Uh, so I, I, I don't know, I, I don't think there have been any real enforcement actions taken um, since the government put the Navy in charge. So I, I think that awaits to be seen. Um, likewise, there have been numerous laws passed um, to make poaching um, illegal. First, it was a, a felony if and was charged as organized crime if there were at least three people involved. So of course there were only ever two people involved. <laughs> you know, there were these loopholes that were in the law and then, you know, every time something got to the courts, it just got kicked out. And so basically in both of these villages, there has been no consequences and there's been no rule of law throughout this entire period even though a lot of the fishermen are begging for it, it's just not happening. Um, and, and, and it's one of the reasons why I pointed out that the court reform that I just heard a wonderful talk by a woman, uh, a barrister who works for the United Nations, um, who's trying to deal with illegal wildlife trade in Africa. And the way that they're dealing with it is by reforming the court system and the legal system, because they needed people to be able to enforce the laws to see that the laws were enforced justly. And as long as they felt that 
you know, if there was no justice, then, you know, nobody wanted to really participate um, in the conservation efforts. And, and I think it's the same problem in Mexico. And I, and I just really don't know how that can be readily solved. I guess the other thing I'll say, and, and I, I didn't mention this and meant to, is that the other um, two things that are important in the Vaquita realm are that uh, quite a lot of the seafood, particularly the shrimp, um, the best market is in the United States. And for the past several years, um, the Marine Mammal Protection Act has actually kicked in and put an embargo on gill knot gill net caught shrimp um, from Mexico. <clears throat> and it, it has really been motivational for the fishermen to want to use alternative gear. And there is alternative gear. You can catch shrimp without using gill nets, but it's less profitable. Um, but there's been no um, real push on the side of the fisheries department and the government of Mexico to make that happen for the fishermen. And so that's, that's something where I think the US has played and could play a much stronger role. And that same law, by the way, that requires um, for to import seafood into the United States, the uh, importing country has to show that they meet the same standards that American fishermen have to meet with respect to protecting marine mammals. Um, and, and that could be a very powerful law, um, but we'll see how it is going to be implemented. It, it's, it's just now they gave, you know, sort of put countries on notice, except these emergency cases like vaquitas, but they sort of put countries on notice and said, you've got five years to show us what you're doing to, you know, make life better for, you know, marine mammals in your fisheries. Um, and then we're, we're going to, you know, start putting restrictions on importation. So, so that's a really important thing. And then the other thing that is interesting is there is this, uh, the new version of NAFTA, USMTR, I think it's called, has more environmental protections than the old version of NAFTA. And there were three items that were listed as the most important uh, environmental issues that had to be uh, improved um, before the US would consider uh, trade to be equitable. And one of them was vaquita and fisheries. And so um, there, there are some uh, things that can be motivating Mexico uh, to do the right thing. Um, but so far it hasn't happened. Do you know if anyone um, uh, from our government, from the United Nations is trying to engage China directly about, um, you know, doing something about the Totuaba uh, market or doing, taking some sort of action in order to um, have an impact here? Yes, so originally when Mexico approached China because uh, Totuaba were the first marine fish that was listed under the Convention for the International Trade of Endangered Species, to which China is a signatory. And they, hello kitty. <laughs> <laughs> and they basically uh, said, it's your problem, not ours. You need to solve it at your end. I mean, China basically just blew Mexico off. But in the last few years, um, China has stepped up and they actually have made several enormous serious busts and they put people in prison. So nobody, nobody until the very recent past has actually gone to prison in Mexico, but they have in China. Um, that said, it's still an incredibly difficult thing to control because fish, weirdly, are not considered to be wildlife. And so when they crack down because of COVID on the wildlife markets and the wild trade markets, it did not include fish. And buche, the dried swim bladders, um, are huge in the markets in China. And in fact, um, the original uh, 
swim bladder was for a Chinese species, Bahaba, which now is right on the brink of extinction or may even have gone extinct. And they're branching out into a bunch of other similar fish. These fish are all croakers. Um, and so there's a lot of concern of this uh, spreading to be a sort of a whole trigger of endangered species that are being traded. And, and all of those are completely legal. You know, so you have these huge markets that have all these dried swim bladders and a couple of these, you know, super expensive pricey Totoaba swim bladders. And it's just, it's just a really hard thing once it gets to the markets in China to control it. But they've done still more busts than Mexico has. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's turn a little bit toward um, education about um, sustainable seafood. Um, we have a number of questions related to, you know, any simple tips that we could give to people to help them make better educated decisions about their um, selections when buying seafood. Um, and another question related to that is, can any seafood from the Gulf of California be trusted? Um, let's see. Yeah, let's go with those two questions. Well, that's a really good question about, can any seafood from the Gulf of California be trusted? Um, there are several species that I say, would say can't be trusted. Um, shrimp, blue shrimp in particular, um, they, they know that there was a huge amount of laundering that was going on where uh, people were importing shrimp that they said were caught in trawlers, but actually had been laundered and were caught through gill nets. So I, I think that's a real problem. Um, there are several species that only spawn in the Northern Gulf. So uh, Corvina um, and probably Sierra from the Northern Gulf, they're all gonna be gillnet caught. So <clears throat> I think none of those are safe um, right now. And I don't think there's a really good mechanism for traceability. There are um, several, again, real hero groups um, that are working towards alternative gear and traceability. And, and I think that that's just such an important part. Um, and as part of, you know, trying to negotiate with Mexico to um, do away with the embargo is establishing methods to be able to trace, you know, and make sure that people basically are using the right gear and aren't cheating. And it, they include, you know, putting trackers on all the pongas so that you know where they go, how they've been behaving. You can tell a lot from the trackers about whether they're doing gill nets or whether they're uh, doing trawls. I mean, they're completely different methods. One's passive and one's active. So, 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 so there are good ways to do that, um, but none of them have been effectively implemented, um, even though the government of Mexico is um, saying they're gonna do it, um, they actually aren't, uh, aren't funding it and aren't giving the permits to do it. And so, so there are some really good fishermen down there. It would be wonderful to be able to support them um, and to support their um, developing uh, traceability. And I have to say on this side of the border, there've been a lot of um, people who have been really dedicated towards um, sustainability chefs that are, you know, only purchase sustainable goods and work directly with the fishermen to try to get them more money. Because most of the, most of the attraction to gill nets is that they're incredibly profitable. You know, they're a passive gear. You, go out there in your ponga, you stick it in the water and you don't have to use any gasoline. You just pick the net up, you know, hours later and everything's dead in it, you know? Whereas if you're doing a, you know, a, a trawling type gear, you actually have to pull it and use gasoline. And so it's less profitable. 
And so somehow the fishermen have to make a living and they have to make up for the differences between these different kinds of gears. And so consumers have to be willing to pay the, pay the price for sustainable fishing. Um, but if you, if you could see that it really was sustainable and that there really was tra traceability, I, I think the consumers would be willing to support blue markets, um, but it's just making it happen. Thank you. Um, another question related to education. Has there been any effort to educate the Mexican public directly about this unique endemic porpoise? Yes, but that's been, I think, a really hard one. Um, the San Diego Zoo had a program with school children for a number of years. There are a couple of really excellent Mexican NGOs um, that work particularly in um, San Felipe. And when the Vaquita CPR program was happening, there was lots of, you know, they were involved in the, the community, was involved in the construction, you know, the people who were working there were living in the community, you know, the kids were seeing what was happening. It was, it was, a, and we really hoped that actually having the vaquitas there was going to be this amazing opportunity to engage the community and make it, a, instead of something that caused them to suffer, something that was good for the community. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, El Golfo de Santa Clara has always been a much more difficult problem uh, because it's closer to the U.S. border, and it's there's always been a lot of drug running and human trafficking there, and so it's it's a pretty lawless and scary place, and it's pretty hard to get uh, NGOs to work there. Uh, but as I say, there have been some some good. Um, local NGOs that have uh, tried their best to, to get things to work. But, you know, it's, it's such a scary, toxic situation now that it's, it's a really hard, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you'd like to go back in a time machine to 1990 um, and be able to do community work um, and involve all the stakeholders like IUCN likes to back at that point. But now it's, it's just really very difficult. Um, some more questions about the Bakitas. Um, do you know anything about, or do, do you know much about the history of the distribution of the Bakitas and why their range has been so limited? Um, also, do you know um, if there are any closely related sister species, so to speak, um, of the Bakitas? Yes, so um, vaquitas are very unusual in being a desert porpoise. Uh, most porpoises live in cold, productive waters, um, and their nearest relative is actually um, in is Burmeister's porpoise and spectacled porpoises in South America. So, what? probably happened was there was some period when there was cold water that stretched all the way up um, and that the Kitas basically got isolated up in that sinus in this perfect little porpoise habitat um, that isn't found for thousands of miles in any direction from there. I suspect, and this is honestly hand waving, but it's pretty educated hand waving, um, that there's a couple of reasons why they are where they are. Um, you can tell when you're in vaquita water. It's sort of the color of green that's in the wall behind me. It's this sort of murky, incredibly productive green. And it's because there's these huge tides that rip up one side of the gulf hit the muddy Colorado River Delta and come down the other side of the Gulf. And it stirs up all of this mud. And it's just, it's one of the most productive oceans in the world. And I think that is perfect porpoise habitat. Um, and because their echolocation is so high in frequency, I think they outcompete dolphins in that special habitat. You know, once you move even a little bit south from there, you get into clear waters or even a little bit more onto the other side. 
of the Gulf, you get into clear waters and you don't see vaquitas there, but you see lots of common dolphins and you see lots of bottlenose dolphins. And so I think they've just got this special little niche that they've been able to do very well in this one little spot. Um, and I suspect it also doesn't hurt that they probably can reduce their chances of being eaten in one bite by a great white shark or a killer whale, both of which are found um, in the Gulf. And of course, <clears throat> they, if you have lots of animals like harbor porpoise off of San Francisco Bay, you can afford to you know, lose a few to great whites and, and killer whales and bottlenose dolphins. But for vaquitas, I think having that special little hidey hole um, has, has been their key to success. Thank you. Um, we have a few questions related to uh, research, your research um, and, and doing the surveys. Um, one question is, since the Bakita are highly sensitive to boat noise, do you think that using drones as part of your survey set of tools would be beneficial? and reduce the stress. Um, another question is about stress behaviors. Um, were there, what stress behaviors were you able to ID from the two captured vaquita um, to add to the vaquita ethogram? Uh, the comment here is, watching the documentary Sea of Shadows, the female displayed a very unusual forward moving spy hop or S-shake posturing with head arched up high at 45 degrees um, that has not been seen during undisturbed conditions in the wild as far as, as this gentleman knows. And that is from Thomas Kaikef. I might pronounce your name incorrectly, Thomas. Thomas Kaikefer. Oh, hi, Tom. <laughs> okay, so now you're going to have to remind me of the first question, or maybe I should tackle the second question. You can question. do the second one first, and then right. we can go back to the first. Okay, uh, yeah. so, so the stress question um that mm -hmm. actually was the calf the in the movie the one that they released that was um like raising its head up and arching that actually according to the veterinarians um is one of the things that is a real warning sign of stress is this arching this arching behavior um and that calf displayed it early on and then sort of settled a little bit. And then, you know, when they took it to the C pen, it started displaying it quite a bit. And that's when they said, that's, that's it. We're taking it and we're releasing it. And then the, the film was taken um, after it was released. And we don't know the fate of that animal. Um, we have its blood chemistry and it, it definitely was showing signs of stress. And even when we first caught the calf, the veterinarians were having a lively discussion about, you know, sometimes when you take young animals into a novel situation, they do better and sometimes they do worse. And the decision was to just give it a try. And they gave it a try and decided that, no, this, this animal was not um, going to settle down. And so they released it. So yeah, we don't know what the fate of that animal was. And, and the other question was about uh, reducing, reducing stress by using drones. So right. amazingly, um, they did get some drone footage that was in that movie um, of the animals um, during the, one of the failed capture attempts. Um, and it was like they were like super skilled drone pilots and they got the footage completely by accident. <laughs> Only because they were focusing on the boats and the animals happened to come up. But basically the water is so turbid that you can only see about that far down in the water. So they, they just disappear. Um, and so it, it's very difficult, in fact, Initially, like back in the 1990s, we and for harbor porpoise, a lot of the surveys are actually done from airplanes. Um, but we could, we it was tried with vaquitas, 
and they did a ton of survey and they only ever saw like one vaquita. And this is probably back in the era when there were probably a thousand vaquitas left. So the water is just too turbid to use it as a survey method. But um, I didn't talk much about um, surveys in shallow water. So those big ships, obviously, can't go into the shallow water and the vaquitas are in shallow water. And so we always, a lot of the imprecision and the abundance estimates comes from um, the shallow water area. And so in 2008, we actually used a uh, really cool trimaran with a towed acoustic array on it to do um, the transects in the shallow water area. So that survey actually used a silent, a stealth boat um, to do the shallow water area. Then in um, 2015, that's when we'd switched over to the sea pods. And so that was actually much more effective because we were able to put lots of detectors out there, leave them for a lot of time. And we also put them in the area that we were surveying visually so that we could calibrate between the density that we saw and knew was in an area and the number of clicks that we were getting on the acoustic recorder. So, so that's basically how we make the acoustic visual estimates. I didn't get down into the, into the weeds on that one, but that actually works very well. And obviously the sea pod sitting on the floor don't dis disturb the animals at all. Um, what, what you do lose, of course, is that you aren't seeing them. Um, and so you, you don't get group size um, and you don't get whether there's calves or not. And so I think really the best of all worlds is combining the visual and acoustic together. Speaking of acoustic, do you, is there a publication reference on the acoustic data that's been collected? Oh yes, there are many publications. Um, uh, I don't know what the best way to get them to you. I, I could send you, probably what I could do is I could send you the latest reference, um, which is um, by uh, Armando Jaramillo, and it will reference all the earlier ones. But basically we did a publication from 2011, at least every two years, we put out a publication on the status and the development of the acoustic data. Great, thank you. Um, we are kind of nearing the end of our time here. So um, I'll try to wrap up with a few questions, um, a few last questions. Um, one theme in our questions here is that people want to know, you know, what, what can, where can they uh, donate? Who can they give, give funds to, to support um, their efforts to save the vaquita? Um, one organization that was called out in particular is the Museo, I just lost the name that you mentioned um, earlier in your talk. I don't think you can donate to Museo de Baena. That's what I was looking um, for. Sea Shepherd, obviously you can. Um, and Vaquita CPR still exists um, and can take donations. And they have been able to take funds from US donors and put it into Museo de Ballena. It's the cross-border the cross border issue. So, so I think those would be the, the two organizations that can get funds to like net removal efforts. Great, thank you. Um, and then a couple other conservation idea types of questions. Um, have there been discussions about potentially cloning vaquitas? And the other related question is, um, I'm sure there have been discussions about, uh, you know, are there any uh, bay or lagoon areas in the Sea of Cortez or near San Felipe that could potentially replicate the, um, the Oxbow success with the Yangtze project um, to create a sanctuary for vaquita? So let me start with the cloning question. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, living cells from both the animals that we captured in the San Diego frozen zoo. And a lot of people think that 
the purpose of the San Diego Frozen Zoo is to um, be able to clone animals. Um, and that is actually not the case. Um, and also we have no males. So, so it, it would be uh, impossible to de-extinct vaquitas. And, and we did in the years right following, like in 2018, that first effort, um, we made a, a very serious attempt to be able to biopsy um, and try to get some cells from males. But uh, the vaquitas that are left, as I mentioned, they are survivors and they would not let us get anywhere close to them. Um, so I, I really think that option is entirely off the table. But while I'm talking about the San Diego Frozen Zoo, um, they, they are doing amazing things. And it's uh, good for people to know that the real reason that they made the San Diego Frozen Zoo was to be able to keep a, a library of genetic diversity uh, of animals that were at very low numbers so that they could reintroduce that genetic diversity back into the wild population. And a classic example of that is white, white rhinos, northern white rhinos. Um, they have uh, the genes now from uh, 20 northern white, white rhinos, two males that never reproduced. So they are, have actually now um, have their first fostering effort going on where they're using uh, another species of rhino to raise up a northern white rhino egg and give birth to a northern white rhino even and from a male that never produced offspring. So, so that was the real idea um, behind the, the frozen zoo is to maintain genetic diversity to introduce back into populations. And clearly you're not going to be able to do that with vaquitas, um, but it still was extremely useful to have that living cell line um, to be able to, to look into and try to understand. I mean, it's still a mystery to scientists. How does a species which with such low genetic diversity manage to survive? You know, it's one of the things that geneticists still don't really understand. And only by really looking into the genes of these species that are naturally depauperate of genetic diversity, will we get to understand that? And, and I think be able to say, okay, this species looks like the Kita and they were actually okay. So maybe we don't have to worry about them, but this species looks like, you know, uh, Florida panthers um, and they really are gonna have some genetic issues and we're gonna have to take some sort of proactive conservation effort. So, so there's, I think, a lot to be learned, um, even if we aren't de-extincting animals um, from their genetics. And there was a second part to that question. Um, yes, what was the second part? <laughs> um, hmm. I lost it. Well. Uh, we were asking about um, about the potential of using. Uh, yes, we were asking about um, potential of using a nearby bay or some other area mm -hmm. for a, a possible sanctuary for vaquita. Yes, there um, we we were looking into that and sort of the engineering that would have to take place to make that happen. Unfortunately, there's no place that's right next to where vaquitas live, mm -hmm. um, but there's an area Bahia Gonzaga that's about 60 miles south um, that has some nice little inlets that you could block off and use like those lakes. And, and it was one of the things that was really eye-opening to me when we had that meeting in Nuremberg with all these scientists from South America and you know Asia all over the place is that once people saw the example of Yangtze finless porpoise, they were like, oh yeah, 
we actually have a place like that where we could put Franciscana or the Amazon River dolphin. There are areas that are completely dammed off already where there are animals living. They're sort of made their own little, you know, oxbow lake as it were. So, you know, if you, if you have that image in, a mind, in your mind of, oh, I can, I should be looking for places to have insurance populations. Um, there are more of them out there than we ever dreamed about. Okay, I know we haven't gotten to every single question, but I think we've gotten to the majority. Um, there is a list, a short list remaining. Uh, so if it's okay, I, I can send that list to you, Dr. Taylor. And if you have a few minutes to respond, and then we can try to uh, reply to folks to, to answer their questions for them um, after the presentation. And I will hand this back to Susan. Yeah, what a wonderful talk. Um, just so enlightening, if not sobering as well. And uh, I want you to know, Dr. Taylor, that the reception uh, coming through the, the chat and the Q&A is just uh, gratitude for everything that you've shared and your work. And I think, um, the yeah. And the last um, question that may be pretty relevant to many of us is um, given, given all that you, your involvement, um, really intimate involvement with the vaquitas um, and with the precariousness and looming extinction, what keeps you going? Yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, there are ups and downs. I mean, you have to be, I think, to be a conservation biologist, you have to be a born optimist. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I've been like everyone this last year, um, spending a lot of time out in nature, sort of recharging the batteries. Um, and I think finding those things that make you happy and allow you to do that, to recharge your batteries, um, is a really critical thing. And I have to say that I haven't talked much about Lorenzo Rojas Bracho, but um, he's been my partner in crime and all of the Vaquita work along with many other people, but him especially. And the pressures that he faces in Mexico with the, you know, just sort of the day-to-day -day, uh, issues dealing with the government of Mexico, I fortunately don't have to deal with that level of stress, but I so admire the people who do. Um, and, you know, it really is important to give those people pats on the back because they're going through some rough times. And I think we're all gonna be facing, it's gonna be a rough couple of decades on planet earth. Um, and so we all need to support each other. Well, that's a great way, I think, uh, to conclude this great evening. So thank you again. And thank you, our ACS community. And uh, we'll be uh, putting the link up on our website under events. And with that, we hope to see you in uh, March. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.